Hey Dale. Yes? My head popped up from my conversation with a young elementary school teacher. She'd spent the last 30 minutes explaining how going to a swinger party wasn't normally her thing. I'd been listening, but mostly I'd been paying attention to the delicate locks of downy blonde hair that hung around the nape of her neck. We could use your help, Allie thinks we've got a creeper. Where? I asked. She's in the garage with him now. Sorry, I said, flashing a smile at the pretty young teacher. This happens. I'll just go take a look and I'll be back in a bit. She giggled some affirmation while I got up. I had to duck my way around one couple groping each other in the cramped hallway before I got there, momentarily stopping to chastise our accountant for not using a coaster on Allie's favorite coffee table. To be fair to the guy, he was getting head at the time, but the table's an import and worth a small fortune. She's keeping him busy. Minnie, our neighbor, was waiting for me by the half-open door. She was a little tipsy, leaning to one side and looking awful concerned. We'd had our fair share of unpleasant guests in the past, but something about Minnie's expression worried me. When I stepped through the door I found my wife chatting openly and laughing with Jacob and Alex nearby. She was keeping it jovial, commanding all attention with expert control. That alone let me know she'd already had to do some de-escalating. Hey babe, I said, stepping up and wrapping an arm around her waist. What's up? These are our new guests, she replied, gesturing to the quiet man in front of us. He was younger than he should have been. Twenty-five, tops. Not a bad-looking man by any measure but he seemed about as comfortable as a stray cat in a dog pound. I couldn't tell if he'd noticed the ever-growing number of men around him, but I hoped not. Allie's charm offensives were so effective that most unwanted guests didn't see the door coming until it slammed in their faces. Nice to meet you. I held out my hand and prayed to God this guy hadn't been jacking off. Francis, he replied as he shook it. His grip was limp, cold, and worryingly moist. And this is Nadia. Here we go, I thought as he moved aside to reveal a fold-out chair and its occupant. There's the rub. At a glance, it looked like just a girl in her late teens with a hoodie pulled up and over her face. It didn't take long for my eyes to correct themselves. Her frame was too slight. Her pose was too stiff. She wasn't a she at all. She was in it a doll, and this wasn't some cheap store mannequin either. You could see the pores on her skin and light downy hair along her exposed forearms. Jacob and Alex snickered behind me, and who could blame them? I had to suppress a smirk myself. It got even harder when Allie gave me a nudge and told me to introduce myself, and I had to talk out loud to a fucking real doll. Hello Nadia, I said biting the inside of my cheek so hard it bled. Sorry, Francis replied, she's not much of a talker. Oh, I bet, I said and there were more snickers from behind me. Are you comfortable Francis? I asked. We want to make sure everyone here is comfortable. Little nervous, he laughed, but I'm being brave for Nadia. She's always been the adventurous one. How did you find out about us, Francis? Allie asked with a gentle smile and a tilt of the head. Nadia knew, he replied. She wanted to experiment and we've been talking about opening up a little. It's a lot for the first time, isn't it? Allie asked, leaning forward and touching his forearm. A lot of new couples like to pop in and look around before committing to anything. Great fun for them but not always for the people being watched. Our lifestyle has meant we're extra sensitive to being put on a show. We don't like to feel judged. Now that I understand, Francis laughed nervously. My parents hated meeting Nadia. Jacob let out what can only be described as a kind of squeal of laughter before covering it up with a burst of coughing. Sorry, 
he sputtered. Beer went down the wrong way. He wasn't holding a drink. It's not good to feel judged, is it? Allie said, stepping a little closer to Francis. Without him realizing it, she began to walk him slowly to the door even as he nodded his agreement. And it is so much to digest, all the sights and sounds here, that we have generally found it best for new young couples like yourself to look around and then go away and chew on it. Think about what participation means. That makes sense, he replied. You can't unfuck someone. She smiled as she lifted the doll and placed it in Francis's arms. It's a door you can't go back through. So given that you've spent some time with us, both you and Nadia, it's probably a good idea for you both to give some serious thought about what you've seen and how you feel about it. Oh, of course, he said. Nadia and I will. The door closed and we all returned to the party in a flurry of laughter. Allie had her head on my shoulder as we watched the video on my phone. You could have told me I had a spot on my arse, she grumbled. Jacob's a cop, I said. He's seen worse. How was the teacher? Was Sal her name? Yeah. She made a few comments to Jordan that made him uncomfortable, I said. How bad was it? The word urban was used. Obviously, Jordan's a big boy. I don't think he was too put off by that kind of thing. But it was still pretty awkward. Oof, Allie winced, closing the video on her phone and sitting upright to stretch. I'll speak to her next time we go for lunch. That must have been as awkward as talking to Francis. Not quite, I winced, cringing at the memory of that strange little episode. Poor guy. What do you think his deal was? Oh. I don't know. She yawned and pushed herself up off the sofa. I just hope he doesn't turn out to be some weirdo with night vision goggles and a crossbow. He seemed sincere, I said. I don't know if that's reassuring or frightening. That he did. Utterly fucking bonkers, but sincere. Come on, let's head to bed. We've got a long day ahead of us tomorrow. I pushed myself up and went about locking up. I pulled curtains, made sure any old cigarettes were put out, and switched a few of the hungrier appliances off at the plug. Somewhere in the bedroom, Allie turned on the shower, and I decided I'd hop in and join her once I was done. My last stop was the garage. I'd been tempted to walk past it. It was always a little too dark in there with fluorescent lights that played havoc with the shadows. I'd often catch sight of my own eyeless reflection in my car's windshield and make myself jump, and something about the lingering impression of that damn doll meant I wanted to put the whole place as far from my mind as I could. But when I caught sight of the door at the end of that long hallway I noticed it was slightly open, and a cold breeze was coming through. Inside I found the back door wide open and the lights turned off. A cold autumn wind blew through, sending a few dry leaves skittering across the floor. Images of old slasher films came to mind and as cheesy as they might seem, I felt afraid as I called out and waited for some sign of an intruder. Hello? No one answered, but that didn't mean no one was listening. I had the overpowering sense I wasn't alone in that room and I turned the light on expecting my childish fears to be dispelled. As it turned out I was both wrong and right. Jesus fuck, I cried, barely managing to keep my voice from rising into a scream. Nadia, that doll, sat across the hood of my car in a disturbingly lifelike pose. Her legs were crossed and her head tilted to one side like a teenager waiting for her acne-faced boyfriend to get out of work. There was even a cigarette propped up between her lips. She shouldn't have been there, of course. Not only had Francis no right to break in and leave her there, but it made no sense. The room had been dark but hardly pitch black. It was hard to imagine I could have looked at my car and not seen her, not even as a large black shadow silhouetted against the night. Francis? 
I cried. Francis, are you in here? I stepped down into the garage and silly ideas started to rush into my head. I knew I should be looking elsewhere for that boy. I knew he must be somewhere, probably filming me so he could post the video to a shitty prank channel on YouTube. But I couldn't take my eyes off that damn doll. I kept expecting her to turn towards me. She seemed so natural sitting there, and part of me believed without a shadow of a doubt that she was waiting for me and no one else. I'm sorry to do this to you. The voice that spoke was desperate. It was quiet, almost courteous, but it still touched a nerve in me and I cried out loud. What the fuck? My outburst was cut short. Francis stood in the doorway, blood running down his temple and his clothes torn to pieces. He was crying, his right arm shaking from the weight of a revolver clutched tightly in his fist. You seemed like a nice couple, he moaned. You don't deserve any of this. He lifted the gun and as the barrel passed over my chest I felt my heart flutter and my peripheral vision goes fuzzy. Allie was right, I thought, he is a disgruntled creep and I'm going to die over some innocuous jokes. He put the gun to his temple and shot himself. Holy shit that's creepy. I noticed that when Sal spoke, the little tufts of hair under her ponytail bobbed side to side. There was a second where I didn't answer and only stared, trying my best to remember what exactly she just said. I don't know about creepy, I replied when I finally remembered. I mostly feel sorry for him. Yeah but he was still a murderer, Sal replied. I read that he'd killed his parents. I mean that's just fucked up. Yes, but I've kind of assumed there was something more going on there. We don't know the full story. I just can't imagine that he went so. I stopped to make a little twirling motion at the side of my head. If his parents were normal. I guess it makes sense, Sal said sitting back in her chair. So you guys just upped and left for a month? I'm surprised the police let you. We have friends in the department. Plus, with the porch camera, there wasn't any real doubt about who did it. The best thing we could have done was just leave. Not to mention we had to hire professional crime scene cleaners. We didn't want to be here for that. It was that bad? She asked. I remembered the split-second image of his suicide that had been permanently etched into my mind. It was a blur, a mental image devoid of any real detail except the vague notion of skin breaking at supersonic speed followed by the pattern of bony shards striking the wall. Yeah it was that bad, I replied. Well I'm glad you guys are back, Sal said, a coy smile on her lips. I mean after that first night was so exciting for me. I worried that maybe I wouldn't see you back here again. I felt like I got 10% into my adventure only for it to suddenly stop. Just a short break, I replied. All of that's behind us now. And you're always welcome to an adventure with us. Sounds like fun. She gave me a wink. Can I ask something though, she said, suddenly leaning forward like a confessional. What's that? Why'd you keep the doll? She asked. It gave us all a hell of a fright when we went into the garage. What do we have? Allie asked. Ah, so Sal saw it, as we know. Frank, Alice, Jake, Al, Jordan, Kim, pretty much anyone who, ah, uh, partakes saw it when they all went out there to smoke, sometimes in ones and twos, sometimes as groups. And they didn't think to mention it. She asked. They just thought we'd kept a murderer's sex doll for, what? Shits and giggles. Did they at least see who took it? Does anyone know where the fucking thing went after they were finished getting baked in our garage? They were just having a good time, I said making sure to sound as calm as possible. They weren't really thinking at all. Fuck. Allie vented, her voice shrill and coarse. So 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 what? Do we have a stalker? Francis had a friend? 
Who put the fucking thing there? What did the police say? Suddenly it was like I had a belly full of loose change. I could feel my posture deflating beneath her gaze. I'd secretly been hoping she wouldn't ask and we could avoid my troubled findings. Well, they were initially a little confused about what the relevance of it was. The relevance, she cried. Someone put evidence from a murder scene in our house. Well, here's the thing, obviously. Jacob saw the doll, I said. He was there when we first met Francis. But, ah, uh, as for the actual police who were on the scene afterward, they, ah, uh, they didn't find one. What? Allie cried, her red teary eyes momentarily coming alive with fiery anger. What does that mean? The Nadia thing. It never really popped up during their investigation. I asked Jacob and he checked. He went into the evidence locker. He asked around. He looked at all of the reports and 18 officers and 6 forensic guys and none of them saw the doll sitting on that car. No, 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 Allie stammered. No, that doesn't make sense. They took the doll as part of the investigation. That's why it wasn't there when we got back. Apparently they didn't, I said. They assumed we did something about it. They were going to ask but then they found his parents rotting away in that secret basement and it kind of got lost in all the excitement. Allie covered her face with her hands and slowly leaned forward until her head was pressed into the table. When she finally looked up I could see that she no longer held back her tears. Who took it? And who brought it back? It wasn't Sal, was it? I doubt it, I replied. I checked the porch camera and no one comes or goes that way all night, and it's not like she could have lugged a 60-pound doll through the house with no one noticing. So we've got a stalker? Allie cried, part indignant, part terrified. It was supposed to go back to normal, Dale. You said it would go back to normal with time and this just feels like the nightmare has started up all over again. And I still haven't heard from Jordan. Her voice caught a little on that last part and it was enough to derail the pace of the conversation. For a few long seconds, the air was pregnant with a heavy silence. Why would you? I asked. Well, normally he'd send me a text after a party. My eyes narrowed. Like some memes, just jokes and stuff, she added. Just stuff we can't say in front of the others. Or me, apparently. Allie swallowed. Don't be like that. For a second my wife shrank down into a timid creature, a far cry from the strong and free-spirited woman I had spent twenty years with. The last time I had seen her look so small was when she'd been slumped down in some hospital bed getting chemo. Even the slightest reminder of that time softened me up. Maybe that's why I agreed to what she asked next. Would you mind checking on him, she said. Why can't you? His wife, she wouldn't like that. I mean to say that. I once sat on a sofa with Jordan and watched Kim blow three guys, I snapped. What exactly would she have to be jealous of between you and her husband? He hasn't gotten back to me in a couple of days. I took a deep breath and let it out slowly if only to give myself enough time to decide on a proper answer. What's the fucking point of the rules if you don't follow them? I said having failed at deciding anything. They were your rules. No texting. No calling. No secret little friendships. Dale, she said, shrinking even further. Please? Please just go check on him for me. This whole doll thing just feels like a nightmare. I just want it to be over. Jordan and Kim's cars were both in their driveway, but no one answered when I rang the bell. I tried a few times, even tried banging the door with my fist as hard as I could. But from the looks of it, no one was home. I was left standing there in the rain, ready to leave when something caught my eye. 
I could have sworn a curtain on the upper floor moved a little like someone was trying to sneak a peek without being seen. A part of me figured that maybe Jordan was avoiding me, even though he should have known better than to expect me to come charging over in a fit of jealousy. But another part of me wasn't so sure it was Jordan at all, and without really knowing why I found myself feeling worried for my friends. I wanted to make sure they were okay, mostly for them but also partly for me. I couldn't quite shake what Allie had said to me before leaving. This whole doll thing just feels like a nightmare. I found their back door open, not just open, but thrown wide with the lock smashed in and the top hinge broken off. With no lights on inside, it was surprisingly dark and I struggled to make myself cross the threshold. Guys? I cried, still standing in the doorway. Anyone home? I wanted to phone the police. I knew I should have. But that just felt like it had prolonged the nightmare. What I really wanted was to find my friends, maybe sitting on the sofa laughing, or maybe wrapped up in bed with a stomach bug. It didn't matter. Every second since we'd met Francis it had felt like the world was spinning too fast and my feet were leaving the ground. Reality felt thinner, almost like it was obedient to my anxieties and fears more than logic or rationality. I wanted to assert some sense back onto the world. I didn't want to be afraid anymore. So I took a deep breath and pushed myself inside where I quickly found that none of the lights worked and that someone had left a cup of coffee on the countertop where it now sat ice cold. The hallway leading to the living room was almost completely dark, as was the rest of the house just beyond. The power was cut and the heating was off, making it so cold I could see my breath. I stepped through the kitchen and into the living room where I found the curtains were drawn but otherwise everything was in order. I had no idea what to make of it all. If it wasn't for the shoes by the front door and the cars in the drive, I would have probably guessed that the couple had gone on holiday without telling anyone. Hello? I shouted, facing the general direction of the stairs. Something thumped against the floor upstairs and I was reminded of the glimmer of movement I'd seen by the front door. It must be Jordan and Kim, I told myself, but the words rang hollow star dot asterisk I tried not to listen to the part of me that began to worry. The very notion I might be in danger. It seemed to carry baggage with it. Thoughts of stalkers, thoughts of Francis blowing his brains out and leaving me spattered with gore. And worse, thoughts of that fucking doll sitting on my car and watching me as I stammered a cry for help. No, I decided, they simply must be in bed. I was halfway up the stairs when I heard that same thump again. This time I didn't cry out for my friends. I carried on upwards like some kind of clockwork soldier, having convinced myself that I'd find a sensible explanation up there. But with each step, I felt more and more like a hostage of my own rationality. Surely it makes the most sense to turn around and leave? I asked myself. But then the nightmare might follow, a part of me answered. At the very top, I was met with an eerie silence and the purgatorial lighting of a rainy afternoon deep in a house with few windows. I could see that almost all the rooms were empty from where I stood but not Jordan and Kim's bedroom which had the door shut tight. Not the room with the window that overlooked the driveway. Just beyond that door, something moved. I heard it. It could have been a footstep. I wasn't sure, so I cried out once more. Jordan what the fuck is going on? There was no response. Fuck this, I cried and upon hearing my own voice quiver with anxiety I decided to try and see some measure of control over myself. I barged through the door and right into the bedroom, ready to make any excuse necessary so long as I found my friend safe. I think deep down I expected to find what I did, but it didn't really make it any easier to see. The room was empty, almost. No Jordan. No Kim. Their phones were on the nightstands. Their clothes lay, still crumpled, 
by either side of the bed. Even the duvet covers had been slid aside as if they'd only just woken up. Just around the corner, in the bathroom, I heard the faint sound of a leaky faucet dripping into a tub full of water and I knew it must be full. But there were no living, or dead, people inside that room. Except for Nadia who was sitting upright on a chair in the corner of the room. A latex and rubber simulation of a person posed awkwardly upright. She was naked and I felt a flush of revulsion at the sight of her featureless frame. Everything about her was wrong and it made my skin crawl to see it all laid bare. I would have left were it not for the sound of something sloshing in the tub. A thought entered my head, I wondered if perhaps Jordan and Kim had somehow kept the doll and been using it to play a kind of joke. Cruel or not, I would have been relieved to know that was the case. Staring at it then as it gazed emptily at their bed, I desperately wanted to be reminded that it wasn't real. It wasn't alive or feeling. It just was. A piece of inert matter is devoid of everything that makes you or me special and alive. Because despite everything, it kinda looked alive. It had arms and eyes, a nose with freckles, slender fingers that sat patiently on its lap. I told myself it was some part of the old lizard brain that made me project the notion of a patient predator onto its delicate features. That was what it reminded me of, some deep sea rockfish waiting for its prey to come floating past. Plop. Once again there was that noise from the tub. The door to the bathroom was barely a meter from the doll. If I wanted to find out more, I'd have to get closer to it. I kept my distance from the doll as I approached the door. I tried to ignore it but my nerves were up and my mind was focused on where it sat in the periphery of my vision. I could feel that fucking thing sitting there, like a heat source blazing away at my subconscious. It was positively radioactive in my mind, triggering every deep-seated instinct I had. Plop. I turned the handle and pushed the door and found the bathroom cold and empty. Dingy-looking water sat in the tub, disturbed occasionally by the leaky faucet that sent the water sloshing. I walked over and dipped my fingers into the water, finding it tepid and unwelcoming. Everything about that fucking house was cold like it wasn't meant for human occupation anymore. I rolled up one sleeve and pulled the plug, pausing for a moment to listen to the water gurgle down the drain. Where are you? I muttered quietly to myself while looking back at the empty bathroom. Right here. Jordan. I cried, almost bursting into laughter, ready to turn and find my friend waiting for me. The laughter died when I saw who was there. Nadia had moved, sitting upright on the bed and looking into the bathroom. She was not alone. Two latex figures sat beside her so that three pairs of glassy eyes faced me. One had been made to look like Jordan, the other to look like Kim, and they were all smiling and naked, their plastic limbs resting nonchalantly on each other's bodies. Why so shocked? Jordan's voice was the same, but when that plastic mouth moved to shape the words I felt as if my feet had finally left the ground and my mind went airborne. My vision blurred and the skin on my scalp tightened like there was a big screw being turned at the back of my skull. Blood rushed from my brain and went to God knows where as every inch of my body struggled to reject the scene before me. This isn't anything you haven't seen before. Kim chuckled as her head turned stiffly to face Nadia. I snapped and ran straight through the door, desperate to escape. Only my progress was stopped partway as something wrenched at my jacket. Nadia's plastic arm had reached out and grabbed my jacket, pinning me to one spot like I was an unruly dog with a leash. I'll see you this weekend, she said in a husky voice. And then just like that she let me go and my feet finally finished carrying me out of that room and out of that house, their laughter following me the entire time. I think we should cancel this weekend's party. I said as I sat opposite Allie. So far, I'd managed to avoid mentioning what I'd found to Allie, 
but she clearly sensed that I wasn't being honest and had been cold to me ever since. I thought she figured I was hiding something about Jordan, maybe that I'd gone and told Kim and gotten her little friend in trouble. I don't want to, Allie replied. She'd spent the last hour sitting on the sofa with her knees pulled up to her chest. I don't like the way this place feels when it's empty. I think we should go away again, I said. We've got the money. We've got the time. Allie looked at me and almost smiled. Almost. What? I asked. I don't want to do another two weeks in some rainy flat with you, she replied. Just hiding from all our problems. I thought it was quite nice, I said. Just you and I. Dale, we both know neither of us signed up to live in each other's pockets, she said. I like our life, as it is. I don't want to leave it behind for what could be months, maybe even years. No one's even replied in the group chat, I told her. We don't know if anyone's coming this Saturday. They're grown-ups, Allie replied. They know it's every other weekend. It's not like we need them to RSVP. No one is this quiet for this long, I said. Well they're our neighbors aren't they, she cried. Sal lives like eight doors down. Jacob's around the corner and you saw him a few days ago. Just go knock and see what they're doing. Sal? I knocked on the door and waited, looking anxiously in the direction of Jacob's house. I'd last spoken to him in a panicked phone call after seeing Jordan. He'd come quickly to where I'd pulled over on the side of the road and was mostly a good friend. I say mostly. I asked him to make an official report on what I'd seen, to go get help from his friends in the station. He'd refused, looking at me in a kind of sad way that broke my heart, like I was an elderly dog that was due one last trip to the vet. After that, he stopped returning my calls. Sal. I cried, suddenly desperate to break my train of thought. Sal please open the door? No one came, but on a hunch. I tried the handle and the door opened easily. Inside I found a familiar scene. The rooms were cold. The curtains were drawn. There were a few signs of an early morning start for the young teacher who lived there. A blouse was hung up on the kitchen door next to an open ironing board. A mug sat by the kettle with a tea bag already inside. And the washing machine door was open with a few damp towels left to dry on a nearby clothes horse. Sal. This time I didn't shout. It was more of a whimper. Something was wrong and I already knew what. I could feel it in the air. Upstairs, I found two locked doors, not one. And I was reminded that Sal shared a rental with her close friend who she talked about a fair bit. I hoped to God that both of them were safe. I tried the nearest door and for the first time since entering, I felt something like relief. There was no one there, just a rumpled bed and a few photos of Sal and some people who bore a family resemblance to her. Without meaning to, I laughed and began to seriously entertain the notion that I had been seeing things back in Jordan's house. Seeing that young man's death had left me seriously on edge. Maybe everything I'd seen had just been trauma. For weeks it had felt like my mind was fraying at the corners. And while this line of thinking was hardly comforting, it did give me the courage to try the final door. Oh shit. I cried, shocked and embarrassed at the sight of a naked young woman standing with her back to me. I immediately pulled the door shut and began to stammer out an apology. Oh, Jesus. I didn't mean to break in. I'm just a friend of Sal's and the door was open and I had this ridiculous idea that something bad had happened to her in. Slowly, it dawned on me there'd been no cries or gasps or shouts. I'd never met Sal's friend, but whoever was in that room, their reaction to having their privacy invaded by a total stranger hadn't been to scream or threaten me with the police. It had been silence. 
Well, I realized as I held my breath and listened, not quite silent. Something was creaking on the other side of the door, like wood under strain. It made me think of tightening rope and badly oiled metal. Are you okay? I asked as I opened the door and saw once more the young woman standing naked with her back to me. Her downy blonde hair was short and messy, but something about her was all too familiar. I figured it couldn't have been Sal, despite the resemblance. She was too different as if she was Sal reduced. Her waist shrunk down. Her shoulders made diminutive. Gone were the faint dimples along her thighs and bum, the faint blue webbing of veins by her ankles. Everything I saw now was smooth and blemish-free. So grossly devoid of character as to betray itself as dead and lifeless, a homogeneous slab of nothing carved to look human. Sal? I stammered. She turned to face me, her head rotating effortlessly without her shoulders or feet having to move. What an adventure, she giggled, bending one elbow in the wrong direction to have a hand awkwardly cover her mouth. Her eyes, enlarged to the size of golf balls, moved independently to look at me. What happened? I cried. Would you like a threesome, she cried in an infantile voice. My friend and I are ever so keen. There was maybe half a second between her shrill giggle and her launching herself over the bed and right at me. Even with my hand already on the handle, and with my nerves so fraught that my reaction was lightning fast, she reached the door before I had time to slam it. Three fingers that looked like cheap Halloween decorations poked through, and she wrenched the door back open with such little effort that I was thrown headlong into the room with it. Come see her, she screamed grabbing me by the hair and lifting me. Somehow, even though I'm not a small guy, she lifted me off the floor and walked me into the bathroom where she showed me what she had trapped in the tub. She's the shy one. Sal said, tilting her head to one side in some twisted affectation. Jesus. I stopped struggling when I saw what lay in the bath. There was a young woman pinned down beneath what looked like sheets of heavy skin-colored rubber. Silently she writhed beneath a sloshing mixture of featureless flesh and discolored blood that coagulated along the edges. Two red, swollen eyes pled with me for help, like she wanted to scream but couldn't. With mounting horror, I realized why. She wasn't beneath the sheet of rubber. She was the sheet of rubber or at least bits of her were. Where it buried itself into her skin, it melt what came beneath in what must have been an agonizing process of slowly flaying flesh. She could not scream because her mouth had been lost to the biological stew that consumed her, and even as I looked, a fake-looking pair of lips rose from the clay-like substance that engrossed her, and smiled. You are so handsome. It cooed. Can I call you master? Something about it, about the words. It broke me. I no longer tried to unfurl Sal's cold fingers from my hair. Instead, I grabbed her wrist and pulled, deliberately tearing a massive chunk of my scalp free in the process. It hurt like nothing else I'd ever felt, but it was worth it just to feel my feet touch solid ground. Sal made no effort to grab me. See you at the party, she cried. Oh, I am so excited for the party. I nervously combed over my hair for the thirtieth time, hoping the patch missing from my scalp wouldn't be too noticeable. Why don't you pop down and see how everyone's doing? I'd been dreading this for quite some time. I thought I'd wait for you to finish getting ready. I cried. Hearing how close my voice was to breaking made me wonder how I would possibly make it through the night. Oh, don't be silly. Allie laughed as she shuffled about in the bathroom. Go on. I'm sure Sal's waiting for you. You two have been getting on like a house on fire lately, haven't you? Gently I touched my head and winced. I suppose. I straightened out my shirt and opened our bedroom door. 
The sound of the clinking of glasses and braying laughter from the guests downstairs reached me in the hallway and I stopped, momentarily taken aback by how easily things might seem normal. Don't keep them waiting. Allie sounded tense as she slammed the door shut behind me. I straightened my shirt once more as a nervous gesture before taking the stairs. The first guest I encountered was Minnie, sitting on the bottom step with a glass of wine beside her. H.H. having a good night? I asked. She rotated her head stiffly and looked at me with lifeless eyes. Burgundy painted lips curled upwards in a mischievous smile as she winked at me. When she went to raise her dress with rubber fingers I turned away and rushed out of her reach. Let me find you another drink. I cried, desperate to make any excuse I could. In the dining room, I found Jacob and Alex watching their wives caress and kiss each other, their plastic limbs squeaking under the friction. When they noticed me, all four of them turned in silent judgment and stared. None of them spoke. They only smiled, waiting for me to join in. Unsettled by their gaze I hurried away, stumbling across one bizarre scene after another. All of our friends had come and the party was in full swing. People kissed each other hungrily and fucked openly in the corridors. Plastic toes and fingers explored rubber joints and frighteningly lifelike bodies leered at me with suggestive thrusts. Not all the bodies were anatomically correct. It seems imagination had started to overtake the reality of the human form, and I was left reeling from one room after another as I fought to hold off a full-blown mental breakdown. It was a living nightmare and without realizing it, I shepherded myself away from one grotesque orgy after another until, somehow, I stumbled through the garage door and slammed it shut behind me. Oh, I am so glad you're here. The voice was all too familiar. Nadia was sitting on her little fold-out chair, as disgustingly realistic as she had been the very first time I met her. I was afraid Ali wouldn't convince you to keep the party going. No 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 no, I sobbed. Yes yes yes, she said, her monotone words dripping with sarcasm. What the fuck are you? I cried. I don't know, she said, and this time she genuinely seemed a little sad. I clawed my way out from that basement thinking I was free but I was already dead. I didn't even get to take my body with me. Gingerly she touched a finger to her face, depressing the plastic to make a little dimple. I had to get a new one. It's not always God who answers prayers, you know. Just ask Allie when you see her. It was her cancer that called to me. I was hardly the answer she wanted. No. SSS she beat it, I said. That was. Jesus that was over 15 years ago. Now you're being deliberately dense. Nadia shook her head they say remission for a reason, Dale. They don't say cured. It had come back and it was tearing through her one organ at a time and she could feel it. So could I, for that matter. I decided to offer her the one thing I never had. Never. Not once. I offered her a choice. A way out. Not the ideal way. But at least the party could keep on going. From behind me the door opened and closed, briefly letting in a flourish of the nightmare that still raged on. The hand that rested on my shoulder was cold and firm. It was also plastic. Hi Ali, Nadia said. How do you like it? I feel cold. Well you better find someone to warm you up, Nadia replied while winking at me. The hand on my shoulder tightened. When I risked a backward glance, Ali looked down with eyes that curdled my blood. Did you really sell yourself to this monster? I asked. No, she said and for a second I could see that her eyes were almost overcome with heartbreak. That only made the words that followed a thousand times more painful. She sold you, Dale, Nadia said, rising out of her chair and walking towards me. 
I'd like to meet new people. And I'd like these parties to keep on going for as long as they can. Arrangements must be made, Dale, and having you around to bring new faces and keep the old ones happy, well, it was just about the only thing your wife could offer. Nadia bent down and stroked my face. You know Francis was right about one thing. You are a nice couple, 